Shalom Chavirim! I'm Rafi. I'm Daniela. And you are watching or listening to B'nai Kiva's brand new podcast, Past and Present. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify and Facebook. We'll be interviewing Chavirim of B'nai Kiva of the past and present to share with you some exciting insights into their lives. Our first guest on Past and Present is, well, in the world of B'nai Akiva, household name. Now, you may have sung a song include, with the name of this person included, but never actually met the man himself. Well, this is your opportunity to meet the one and only Michael Rainsbury from South Woodford. Woo! We will find out more about Michael Rainsbury in this podcast, so I'm not going to give him a heavy introduction, but a um, prominent Mazkarat member who's now living in Eretz Yisrael. Daniela, over to you. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, um, yes, yeah, so I'm from South Woodford. I guess that's the only way to start. Really. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, it's in like it's in London, like you know, in like the northeast of London, not where all the other people are from. It's like this, like it's square on the tube. Rafi's from there originally. He knows. Um, so yeah, um, from there, uh, I. So I grew up and um, went to Benet Kiva. I went to non-Jewish school in Ilford County, uh, Nazi Shiva Kotel. I'm not sure if anyone else has done that transition. Uh, spent, I did Torani, spent two years in, in Yeshiva. Um, went to Birmingham University, studied history. And, and, and then I did the Maskirut uh, two, two years. It was a Chinuch worker, Maskir. I did Masters. Worked at King Solomon. I went back to my roots, went to Essex, taught at King Solomon School. And that was fun, a couple of years. And then made Aliyah, worked for B'nai Kiva in Israel, running Tony and, and running British stuff from, from England. Um, sorry, from Israel. And then um, and now I work in Eric Sassi. Wow, that is quite a synopsis. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated to know. I'm, I assume um, the viewers also would be fascinated to know where on earth did this all start? Was that a motivation that uh, started your journey off? Listen, like life paths are interesting, right? You, you every yourself and you reflect on them, you wonder like how how did you exactly get here? I think the older you get, the more times you ask yourself that question. Like, there's so many different ways that your life could have gone. Um, if you're asking like what, like why the um, that was that was definitely my childhood. Like South Woodford was very small, Siva. Um, doesn't exist anymore. It was always very small, but it was it was always a, I would say the most meaningful part of my um, my week uh, and, and my life. Like it was the idea, like everyone in the like in the Sivar, There's only a few of us, but the idea of being a Madrid Madrid was was so exciting, and it was what we talked about. It was it was very much like our um, the, what we were committed to. It was like our life revolved around the social and the uh, the events that we did, and it was really all encompassing. And, even though I said there were only a few people, there were, I mean, sometimes we get 40 or 50 in Shalai, but it wasn't like, um, it was just two of us. Uh, it was an actual thing. And uh, oh. so that really gave me the, the passion to get involved in the Kiva. And, and, and I didn't go on camp until year 12. I went to the school. That was my first fun. Wow. So I had just as much of the Kiva upbringing, upbringing as everyone else, just because I didn't go to camp. And because it really was that, had that feeling of, uh, of love in, in, uh, in the Svivam. We did a lot of stuff in Essex as well. And they keep into us with our stuff with like Chihuahua and everything. Um, and then, yeah, then I got involved in uh, um, uh, later in camps and on Santorini and the rest of the journey is more well documented. Sure. I mean, just quickly, um, so you said your first camp was year 12, which I, yeah. I assume is an H course, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you have any particular memories from that camp? Do you want to give any shout out to particular <laughs> Madrachim who are maybe listening to this? Shout out to the Madrachim. Well, there were definitely people who were who were very influential. I actually did one um one story of like a friend of mine, Joe Walson, who's now Rabbi in America. He wasn't he was in my year. I remember that he when we were on the um on the coach to um the, the truth is it was my first national beer event, it was my second. The first one we did a Shevet weekend in Glasgow. 
Okay. Oh, wow. So we've been to Shadow Weekend in Glasgow, and I didn't really know anyone. I mean, I think I knew two people. And I remember Joe Wilson made a real effort to talk to me on the, on the on that. So it wasn't the coach, it was the train, not the train. And um, it was, uh, I, I just remember thinking that was like almost like a turning point because I was so scared of like, you know, I two people out of 100 or 500 people on the show. And, uh, and that was like the turning point of like, oh, yeah, I could, I could forgive him here. Um, and uh, even though actually the whole weekend was difficult for me because not everyone was like that. And I always see people and they say, oh, yeah, it's creepy. Everywhere's creepy, like in the, at the beginning, and it is hard. Um, but eventually they get to know you, and, and that was good. I enjoyed it. I truthfully enjoyed being a Madrid far more than being a Khanif. I think that's also because when I became, I became a Madrid in year 10, which is like ridiculous, but it already had like three years of being like on the So it was actually like, I wasn't, I didn't still enjoy being a Khanif on H course, um, but. It was a good camp. I mean, you know, I, I met friends, still breakfast with some of them today, and yeah. Wow. And um, did you have any other role models like Bene Akiva, not Bene Akiva, just like in general? It's, good. it's really an interesting question. And did, I mean, I, I um, there was someone in, um, I would say there are people in, in, in my, in South Woodford that when I was growing up, I really, um, respected um uncle max would get out sweets he would um make sure to look after the young children talk to everyone in shul and you know when you're a kid he's always one of those people and i remember hearing a story once that um there was um some good family friends of ours who's very involved in the community rather than the the shul um, both the kids were Roshim and Eki in Southwood and they both like one of them actually is still in Jewish education today um, and between the family have done absolutely tons of stuff in the Jewish community anyway they were they became religious and they became religious in Southwood and the story goes that they came to shore once and um, someone was rude to them and said the classic United Synagogue was sitting in my seat and um and Uncle Max went over to them and and kind of pulled them away and said, you got to see next to me. And, and then they sat with him for years and they, they stayed in shore. And then the rest is history. I, you know, the standard answer to say, who's your hero? is like people like, he's not Rabbi Sachs. And he, he was. Um, I don't want to talk about Rabbi Sachs here just because I think there's so many people who are listening to podcasts and presets and think, I'm just going to go for some of this. And, uh, and, he, and, and he was like, I think, um, that idea that that you can have such a transformational um, effect on people's Judaism, people's whole life direction, just by being kind and just by thinking of, of them. And that really kind of, um, for me, that that kind of was what I got from South Africa. There are lots of people like that. There was also the guy that said, don't sit in my seat, but <laughs> he's in my seat. Um, and uh, and it, it, it kind of really motivated me. I've always been um, very kind of, cognizant of, of that of, of the idea that we can have um, a real impact on people and it's it, it's really up to us um shouldn't take it for granted that people are going to be involved people are going to stay jewish um you know we all have a, a role to play in that um i'll just answer in more bene Akiva settings as i grew up it's definitely um i think when i was um when i was around rosh scun Age in South Woodford. I was definitely inspired by the words of Yoni Jezna. I think many people were. Um, if I'd have gone to camp, I probably would have met him and he would have been my Madrid. So I never met him. Um, just for those who Yoni Jezna was making a book there, who was killed in suicide um, bomb in 2002, I believe. Um, but I will say that his words, he left these kind of these, these things. Right? He had this like, list of life messages that he would keep with him. That was very inspirational. Um, and I, I think a lot of people really uh, try to live by them, or at least some of them. Uh, later on, I would say Mark Weinberg, um, in terms of Benek Kiva, also someone who, who passed away. And I'm actually very friendly with the family. I remember his, um, his memorial when I was a Chinook worker, and I remember talking to, him to Anna Levinson, who was the incoming Chinook worker, and I was the incoming Muslim. And we were just, it just, triple their motivations to kind of follow his footsteps and do what he achieved. 
it's incredible to hear of these role models. I'm interested to know, um, many people may have heard the names, Yoni Jesner, um, Mark Weinberg, um, of blessed memory, but maybe these people, um, they're inspired more by their legacy than by knowing them. So did you have the opportunity to uh, meet these people? I know you said with, in Yoni's case, ne you never were able to have his um, have him as a madre because you, you weren't on Machana to year 12. But in Mark's case, uh, would you be able to speak about that? Yeah, I also didn't know. Uh, and again, a lot of people, a lot of people my age did. Um, a lot of people in the people were very affected by that. It's taught them or... Uh, not really Madrid. I mean, there was a big age gap to be to be Madrid. <laughs> but, um, I, but I read a lot of stuff he wrote. Um, and um, if you like, the, the, I didn't know about him really until he died. But when I found out more, um, I realized that this was someone who was really a role model for the Nekiva in the sense that it, it, it really, you know, to, not just to be an amazing Mazke, and everyone said he was a particularly amazing Mazke, but he yeah. said, Chess, um, at a very young age, I think in his twenties. I mean, he was instrumental in like, making sure that Chess, like, she was college and that Chess. Um, he went up to Israel, but he actually brought a whole group of people with him. I mean, that, that kind of thing is, you know, was done in the sixties, seventies. It's not really done uh -huh. in the, um, you know, in the two thousands. So, um, so I, I think um, it was more doing that. I remember when I became Askir, I actually um, went onto his files. You know, you, you can get all the files of uh, different years. I, I read some of the stuff he wrote and it was it was it was pretty amazing. Um he was very much ahead of his time and he um the, the values he stood for are like very much like he was just on the ball and sort of um kind of Nekiva religious Zionism and activism yeah and later also became more friendly with the family as well. Would you say that, like, I know you, you know, you spoke about all these role models that you had, but did you always see yourself, like, following their footsteps? I know, you know, obviously to be a madrich in the first place, like you said, that was a given. But did you always see yourself as taking on a bigger role in leadership, in education? Or was, like, what was the changing point, if not? It's a really interesting question. The answer is, like, yes and no. I, I never necessarily thought I would always work in Jewish education. And I also... Not now. I mean, I I, um, I don't think it's uh, uh, I, you know I I always do it in some form, right, professionally or you know, but um, but I I think um, I remember there was there there, there was definitely uh, an understanding when I became a Madrid and especially when I became a Roch in South Woodford that you were going to be a role model to the community. It didn't necessarily involve me one hundred percent committing to everything. Like, there's no way that I was thinking about the other end, but. I definitely remember there was one time when um, when I when I like re religious changes I made in my life that I realized that in order to take this position I needed to do that. Like everyone's different, you know. I don't want to give the message to, to young people that everyone has to make decisions at certain times. Make it was a process and and it's a journey. People people go on it and people make decisions at different times. And, um, definitely, making that helped me become more fully committed to. You know, to, uh, to, and to ideology. Um, and I would also say that I went into every position with my eyes wide open, like I knew what it meant. Um, I, um, you know, when I signed up to the Maskiru, I knew that Aliyah was something that I was going to do because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Um, I appreciate that's not everyone. And again, I don't think people should not do the Maskiru if they don't have any plans to make Aliyah. I think if they, maybe, maybe if they, uh, if they say never Aliyah, then may, maybe they shouldn't do it. That. If they don't know, I mean, no, again, everyone's different. Um, I, I definitely think, and so one turning point was being in Rosh Hashanah, South Woodford, uh, for sure. Um, one was, um, I should also say, by the way, I wasn't always Shomri Shabbat. As in, like, growing up, we weren't. We kind of had a very long process of becoming Shomri Shabbat and, and Shomri Mitzvah as a family. Um, Bnei Kiva had a role to play in that. Like, Bnei Kiva Shabbat afternoon replaced football and Shabbat afternoon. That was a big deal for me. Um, being a Rosh meant also that there were like sometimes that I would, um, you know, um, like eating out, for example. Like there was a decision I made, like that it wasn't, you know, I was going to keep free kosher at some point. That, that, that was inspired by B'nai Kiva. Um, and also, I think um, being in um, like Torani was incredible and it, like, really opened my eyes to Israeli society. Uh, and, and definitely my whole experience in Yeshiva also 
um, kind of solidified that, those mm -hmm. ideals. And when I came back, I knew I had a bit more of a mission and direction. Um, if you like, it was already there, but it, it gave more, um, more meat. I, I knew what I was talking about. Um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting you, you speak about um, those people who aren't necessarily planning on making Aliyah right away, that they shouldn't refrain from taking up a masquerade role should they want. Um, I, I think it's a great segue into the next question, which we're, we're interested to know about your years on the masquerade and what, in your opinion, your biggest achievements were. But because um, you, I mean, you're about to explain, I think, that uh, you did two different Tafti Dim on the masquerade. And I think there's an interesting mm -hmm. story there about the different uh, Tafti Dim you, 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 um, you did take. I think if you're happy to share, that'd be amazing for the, for the viewers. But um, yeah, would you be able to, in your explanation about your Mazda experience, speak about the um, not only the impact, but like um, um, what things you took from that experience for life? I did kind of work in Mazda here. Um, I think people are still familiar with these positions and, you know, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, um, so I, the education was kind of a natural progression. I was always into like really educating for things in university and on camp. Um, and I, my um, my friend Zach Jeffrey, who was did exactly the same part in Muskier, we're in the same year. But I did Shabbat the year before me, and he uh, he was Muskier when I was Chinuch, and he kind of said, "I think you should you should think about applying for Muskier and have abilities." And I got that idea. I um, in terms of what was what was the kind of success or like of well, achievements, many many things. I. I mean, I really used to see Shabbat Hashem and the Chobar that I wrote as, as real achievements. Uh, there was, uh, I really enjoyed writing those Chobar. I, I still think that they're, you know, I would look back to them and sometimes and think, yeah, that was a, that was a, there were some good ideas. I, um, I really enjoyed um, also like running big events. We did, like we had an event when there was a murder in uh, the terrorist attack in Mecca Zarav. So we had a, um, we had Limud Merkazi. We had like a book Beneki, the Sinai and Ezra together. Um, it was yeah. because, you know, Beneki, we very passionately believe in like mixed education and that is not always shared by uh, organizations to the right of us. We worked out a way of doing it that was um, really tried to be inclusive of everyone and respectful of everyone. That was a very, very meaningful event. And that we did um, stand out. I think when I was Musk here, um, I was very, very keen on like numbers, like not just, not numbers for the sake of numbers, like the quality as well, it's important, but I wanted to make sure that we were always growing. It's really important to, to put a buzz um, to, for people to think that everyone is doing this. Uh, that's part of the kind of the power of the Nikiva. So we had um, the highest numbers of on winter and summer for, for years. It wasn't, I don't know if it was a record number, but it was definitely wow. a, a, like a lot of people. Um, and, um, but also I would say that something I was able to do also for being there for two years, um, was the Chinuch syllabus, uh, which is actually still, I believe in, uh, in use. It may have been adapted. I'm sure it's been adapted. And at the beginning, people consulted me a little bit on those implementations, but we essentially, the idea was that we, th th there was clearly some kind of Chinuch syllabus at some point, but it kind of got lost a bit and some of the campings are a bit random, um, there was one that everyone called Kiss of Him, which no one knew what it meant. People spend the whole camp talking about what what does Kiss of Him mean? Who's yeah. yearning? But everyone's like, what does yearning mean? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like yearning to learning, yearning to earning, yearning to burning. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, that was something in it. I was able to like see that through. And I, I, really, that you can see the impact now because I had spent a lot of time with Kanekim and Nekiva. Get, like on on Torani and stuff, and I know it made an impact. So that's definitely something that I've been very proud of. I think when I was Musk here as well, um, we also ran a campaign, the Mind the Gap campaign. There was like tuition fees came in. We had this. Whole ah. um, it didn't we didn't win? As in meaning we didn't we didn't convince the government to change to change their policy. But I did have a chat with George Osborne, who was the chancellor. Wow. At the time. That was definitely the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> if I may on that, I think, I mean, it's interesting. Maybe um, some members of Chavarim or B'nai Kiva would say, why should B'nai Kiva get involved in that sort of campaign? Where in the Hashkafa, when the ideology of, of B'nai Kiva is 
I, uh, the well, like uh, tuition fees. So, how yeah. would you explain the um, the need for it in yeah. line with the ideology of Bnei Akiva? So it was fairly simple. We thought that uh, Hashara, like the year in Israel, would die. That was that was simple. I, I I really thought that it would it would be over. And um, just a bit put in context, the tuition used to be um, nine thousand pounds. Right, it used to pay nine thousand pounds for university, um, and then at, in one summer that was changed to twenty seven thousand pounds for a three year degree. I'm just like seven three year degree. That's a huge, huge increase. I know that they changed the way of the payments um, you know, yeah. alone, but we thought that that would kill gap years. Or at least, let's put it this way. You, you plan for the worst and you hope for the best. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to, when you're Muskir, on the Muskir, you have to strategize um, on both, like, what you know, don't assume you're going to get no one. Um, you have to, but, but also don't assume you're going to get everyone either. You have to, like, plan for both. So we, we planned and we said, look, you know, there is a real chance we're not gonna we're not gonna have it. Also, it was a small year that was in year thirteen, and we were worried about that. And um, so we said, "Listen, we gotta we gotta try and do something about this." We weren't trying to look. There are a million people or something who marched in London. You can Google it right about getting rid of tuition fees. We weren't campaigning to get rid of tuition fees. It wasn't our fight. It's not that's and we have time for that. Uh, whether you agree or not, don't agree. It was more the fact that we wanted to protect gap years, and we tried to build alliances with non-Jewish gap years. They didn't really get back to us. I'm not quite sure why to this day that they didn't, because um, they didn't seem this active. But in the Jewish world, we did build a coalition um, with all the other youth movements, um, uh, with the UJ, um, with other organizations to try and um, to try and make a difference. And the truth is, though, a lot of the adult organizations weren't so interested in this. It was really just the youth movements, mainly just kind of Benaki and SNY, to be honest. It, we were the ones leading it. A lot of the other youth movements weren't so interested. Um, they put their names to it, but it wasn't such a big deal for them. And um, and we um, and it like we we had a campaign, got to, like uh, signatures and petition. The MP went to Parliament, um, managed to get to chat to George Osborne about what the Nafias are and why they're important, and he listened and uh, didn't change anything. But it was but in terms of awareness, there were people who who they I wanted also even if we didn't. Get the government to change the policy. We didn't think it would. We did want the, the community to know that we were active and we cared about the future of gap years and that we knew that this was critical for making we have gap years in Israel. Um, and um, not just that, we wanted the, gut, the people in, the, in year 13, it was showing the fear at the time, they, we wanted them to know that we were, we were thinking about them, we were campaigning for them, we were asking them to not just spend how much money it was, money it was in the gap years. 12, 14,000 pounds, whatever it was. We weren't just asking them to do that. Plus, of course, foregoing um, the 20,000 pounds that you could have, like, you could have gone to university and paid 9,000, instead they're paying 27,000. So you're asking them to, like, part with 30,000 pounds, basically, um, this gap in Israel. We understand it was a big ask. So we, we wanted yeah. to show doing our bit. And, and, you know, it wasn't the biggest gap here, but we, we were very proud. We got, I think, over 30. 30 people have that is good and I think it also goes to show that like it's worth like the fight and going for the campaign and everything even if it doesn't like take you all the way there's a lot of value in that and I think that's really inspiring because often like we look at you know things that have been achieved and like we look at the outcome as opposed to like the effort and that there's so much value in there um so talking about gap years it's a nice way to like ask you about the current situation today i mean you know given the pandemic that we're all experiencing um do you think that, that it's it's opened the conversation a lot more to you know how valuable is a gap here is it still worthwhile is it financially viable um and is it safe what are your thoughts on that yeah well be working in area to i mean it's uh it here in israel we have been working also with Tony, like Tony Heritage. So working with them for a few years and very much in that world, like gap years, look, gap years for me are absolutely crucial. Um, for Bnei Kiva and for all Jewish youth, you know, spending a year in Israel is is identity shaping. It's um, it's it's about commitment. Um, there's no question that people come to Israel, go back, 
inspired, committed, um, they make a difference, they more, they're more likely to stay on the Jewish path. There's no question for me that the evidence points to that and uh, anecdotal and statistical. I don't think that COVID will change that. Um, I think that um, I think that in any in some ways, look, we don't know what the future of air travel is going to be. Um, we don't know how long quarantine is going to be a thing. I, and it's always dangerous making predictions on uh, on a podcast, which in about three weeks is going to be laughed at. But the way it seems in Israel today is that life will go back to normal within Israel um, before it will go back to normal in air travel. Um, I think that gap years of all of those things, uh, gap years are more likely to survive than your weekend in Israel, right? Um, because gap years is a commitment. You, you wouldn't do a two-week quarantine or 10-day quarantine if you're coming for a week. You would do it yeah. if you're coming for a year. I mean, people did. So I think, I, I think and in terms of it's safe, look, um, Israel is, is in, in a, we are, it's the best of times and the worst of times. We're not, you know, we're in our third wave, numbers are high, but the vaccination program is amazing. And, and as, I mean, I don't know when your listeners are going to listen to this, but today, when we're recording this, uh, you know, we're talking like 25% of the population is already had the jab. So I think that it's definitely going to be safe. I think it's going to be as safe as any, anything. Um, in Eretz, we haven't had it bar for sure. We've not had an outbreak yet. We've, it's been hard for, the, for everyone, but we haven't had an outbreak. Wow. Um, I think people will ask the question of many things like, is it better to do things um, online? And there will, some, there will be some things that will go online, but there's no question that not everything will. And you can just see because the people that are here now have had a year online, half a year online. Like that was their reality from March to July. And they're so happy. They're so happy to be a, uh, to, to now be a, um, uh, to, to kind of doing things in person, even if they can't go everywhere they want to go. So I think it's, uh, yeah. there's no for me, the gap years may have to continue um, for the future of uh, for the future of the Jewish community, for the future of Akiva. Um, I don't, I, I don't think they're in threat. Like just the fact that we got a year this year, not just in England, but in America, it, it, it is surviving. Like people, it survived the Intifada, and it will survive COVID. Just one final question, I think. Uh, as I think we need to wrap up, um, is to do with Aliyah. You're in. Eretz Israel, you've, you've uh, lived the B'nai Akiva dream. Um, I'm uh, also, Daniela, I'm sure the listeners are keen to know, um, did you have difficulty in that decision, uh, even at the point where ideologically you realized, yeah, I bind to the B'nai Akiva ideology, Aliyah, that's important to me. Was that ever this feeling of being torn between staying in England for good uh, reasons? versus that of making Aliyah and the, and the time at which also you wanted to make Aliyah? I, I wouldn't say I struggled with it. I know a lot of people do. Um, I definitely think and do think and thought about it a lot. Uh, for me, and it, look, this isn't everyone's um, dilemma, but definitely if you're, if you're like a Madrid, Rosh, Muscura person and, and it means that education means a lot to you and there are tons of people in the Kiva, then the question that many people have is, stay in England and be effective, make an impact on the community or make a yeah. I, I still think about it. And it, look, that's partly what's motivated me staying in the world of Jewish education as it relates to uh, England. Right? Because it's like a way of saying, I can still be involved. Not everyone can be, I appreciate that. Um, I definitely um, knew, ultimately, the way I looked at it is the following. The impact is... You have to think about impact in, in a number of different ways. There's, there's impact you can have in your community, and um, and there's an impact you can have on the Lekiva. There's also impact you can have on like the, the Jewish future, like looking really ahead. And I I really feel that the most most impact you will have in life is with your children. That is um, because that's going to last generations. It's true. You you could have that effect with the Chaneh or someone in the community or something. It's it's possible. But I think that it, the responsible thing is to think about you and your family. And ultimately, um, if I want my right to use around my sex, phrase, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have Jewish grandchildren to be Jewish, not just be Jewish, to be religious Zionist, to be active in the community, to really mm. understand these things. That Israel is the place. Um, I, um, you know, it's the place where you can live holistically as a Jewish life. 
you can express yourself most as, as Jewish, and also that you can make an impact. I think that Bnei Kiva is about ultimately saying, we are going to impact the, the world, the Jewish world and the world, and it's like thinking bigger than England. I'm not saying that there isn't a role for education in England. I think ultimately, ideally, it should be shlichut. I would be open to doing shlichut in theory. I think that should be a path people take. And I'm not knocking it because I actually think it's really important that some people do stay there. It's just, I think for Bnei Kiva's vision is very much this like kind of like aspirational big picture vision and i think that's that can only be done in israel so i i was very happy with doing it for a time um and uh and i you know it was very meaningful whether it's in benaki i always felt benaki was the most meaningful because because they're you're connecting people with that vision um yeah. in king solomon's days the people had such a, a, a like far less of a connection to judaism and somebody you could say, oh, that was more important but I, I don't think that my impact will be felt as much, uh, even though I really love what I did there. Um, and yeah, I do think about it all the time and it is challenging and it's, it's definitely not an easy decision. I knew it was going to be the, I knew what I was going to make. So I wouldn't say I struggled with the decision. I talk about it all the time with my friends and still do. If you could leave us with one final message that you would want to impart on um, BA UK, what would that be? Um, well, um, look, it's it's always a pleasure to do anything with Nike UK. It's, it was almost so formative in my life, and and um, I think that you know it's it's important. I, I get very inspired when I see just following on social media and seeing my Chanichim, Daniela, like uh, you know being involved in Nike and, and and high levels. And I I think that it's important that it grows, that you you constantly see yourself as aspirational as a movement. There's so much more that you can do. Um, the COVID reality is going to change an Akiva. Use it to change it for the better. There's lots of new avenues that you can that you can use. And an Akiva should always be the forefront. It should be uh, at the forefront of, um, first of all, education, of like, like empowering education and also um, inspiring education. Both of those two things, it's always been at the front of it and it should continue to be. Um, and it should always be that the most passionate young people in in the religious community in England um, should find their way of Bnei Kiva. If, if you have those people and you're attracting those people, and with them you're also attracting like, like not just them, but the numbers as well, then you know you're in a good place. And it's about like uh, it, it, you know if if I could if I could, really the message would be to like look look to what's been done right, be inspired by the past. Think about the future, like dream the future. And if you have those two things, like both the past and the future, then, then and you're really, really committed to like sharing your Judaism, sharing your Zionism and being really aspirational about what you and the Akiva can achieve and not being, not second for second best, constantly like striving to achieve more. I think that you'll, um, you'll make a big impact. And that's, uh, I hope that you'll continue to do that. Definitely, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people in Israel who, who, feel uh, feel that way and look you know we'll check the social media and just feel that the pride that, um, that it's still happening and it's still thriving um you know so keep doing it michael thank you so so much for joining us today um i've been personally very very inspired not only in this podcast but uh, yeah same um and yeah and we're so grateful um in terms of you guys um you listening viewing um michael tells us we need to always look at both the past and the future but not only that we also need to look at past and present our brand new podcast oh. this is number one podcast number one we want more uh, podcasts so do you and who should we speak to next in the comments suggest it's going to be George Osborne. You've got to find out what he thinks about the Nike of Ahashara. George Osborne MP. No. <laughs> Thank Editor you so, the, so much, Editor Michael. Editor of the London Evening Standard. Editor of the London Evening Standard. Thank you so much. Hashem Emachem. Hashem.